Hi there, Lindsay here, The Frugal Crafter. Um, I wanted to do another video as part of the whole declutter KonMari method series. Um, I've gotten a lot of really wonderful feedback on these videos and um, every time I post one I get new insight from um, you about what your challenges are with decluttering and uh, kind of taming the want monster that we have when we see new cool things that we you know didn't know we needed five minutes ago but now we know that they're there we have to have them. So, um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that and talk a little bit about another question you can ask yourself when when you are trying to get rid of stuff or trying to decide whether you need to buy something or not. And um, this is kind of a follow-up to the two questions you can ask yourself uh, whether to get rid of something or not, and that was basically um, what's the worst that can happen if you do get rid of it, meaning well you might have to rebuy it, or you'd have to do without it, or um, what was the other question there? Uh, do you have something else that does the same purpose? So I thought those two questions wrapped up pretty much you know, if you had a tricky item, whether you were trying to get rid of it or not. I thought those two questions did a good job at helping you decide. But there's one other uh, question to ask, and that question is why? Why are you holding on to this thing that you're not using, that um, is not bringing you joy? And there's a couple reasons, and these reasons are very interesting. One reason is flat out guilt. Um, I had a few people comment on that video, on the two questions video, saying that um, they had all of these supplies from when they had an Etsy shop and or when they used to sell, you know, these handmade products at a craft fair. And they're like, I don't do this um, anymore. I have no desire to rekindle this business, but for whatever reason, I can't let this go. And... I could tell you right now what it is. It's when if you let those supplies go, you're automatically putting an end to the possibility of running that business again. You are essentially slamming the door on the opportunity to do that again for a living. And I think that um, especially in these uncertain times, that we cling to those those um, those skills that we may need to employ again if times get tough. Like for me, it's. Um, it's picture framing. I, you know, I don't love picture framing. I enjoy it. It's it's a decent job to do it, but I, I'm not like passionate about it. But it's always been something that I can do if other work dries up. If this whole internet thing goes away, which I don't feel completely confident that, you know, I mean, I, I make my living making crafty videos on YouTube and online classes and stuff and, and times change and tastes change and, you know, I could be irrelevant, you know, anytime. So having those supplies there kind of as a safety net feels good and makes me feel secure. Do I need as much as I have? Absolutely not. I could actually probably get rid of everything but the tools and just order in supplies as needed. And that would actually probably be a smarter way to do it. But since I bought out a bunch of supplies when a framing shop was closing, I have a bunch of map boards and stuff on hand and it just feels so wasteful to get rid of them. And I do, you know, frame my own work, of course. Um, so yeah, I think there's that, la that lack of security if you're getting rid of something. And I think that's one of the problems of getting rid of anything. We feel a lack of security. Like if I get rid of this extra pair of scissors, well, what if I break my first pair of scissors? Well, honestly, all you'd have to do is go buy a new pair of scissors. But you worry, well, will I be in a financial position where I can buy another pair of scissors if these break or what if they break in the middle of a project you know and I think we all have these different levels of comfort threshold that um <clears throat> you know if you live in a city where there's a scissor store next door well you know it's not a huge deal if you only have one pair of scissors but if you live out in the country um, maybe you don't have a car or you can't you know replace that tool immediately you feel good having an extra pair you probably don't need an extra 20 pairs like I have but uh <laughs> but you know, you have to find your own comfort level. So another thing, like I have this stack of student grade pastels and I've used them for teaching kids for years and years and years. And they're still sitting on my shelf. And I just uh, recently told the library that I wasn't gonna do the kids program anymore because my kids are older. At the time that I was running those classes, it's really a time where my children need me. And I've noticed over the years that I have, um, I have less patience now that I have my own children than I did before I had children as far as like teaching children. Now I don't like lose my temper with kids or anything, but I noticed that patience is a limited supply and I would rather dole it out to my children, you know, and plus I don't have uh, as many connections with younger kids anymore now that my kids are teenagers. So my classes weren't very well attended. So I decided that I wasn't going to, that was the last kids class I was doing anyway. And I decided I wasn't going to do that anymore. And I'm like, you know, I really don't see myself teaching children uh, in the future. I, I, you know, I, I actually am really liking doing online classes and the occasional workshop for adults. So 
I think it's time to let those supplies go. Give them to a, an art teacher that can use them. Maybe donate them to the library if their next art teacher could use them. But for me, they're not serving me and I can let them go. But it took me a while to get to that point where I could say, yes, I'm going to let that go and I'm going to close the door on that particular um, that particular section of my business. I'm still teaching classes, just not going to teach the kids classes so I can get rid of the supplies uh, that I would use for kids classes unless my children want to use them, which, you know, honestly, they're at the age where they're, um, you know, my personal professional art supplies are a little bit more um, appropriate for them to use and, and I have enough. So it's, it's not, I don't need to keep the kind of student grade non-toxic pastels around anymore. So um, they weren't serving me. They can go off to where they can serve someone else. I won't throw them in the trash, but I'll see if anybody wants them before I, you know, take them to Goodwill or whatnot. Um, but I, I, it took me quite a few times of asking myself, why am I keeping these here? Well, they're not taking up that much space. Why do they need to take up any space at all? Well, you know, I might want to use them. Do you really want to teach children anymore? Well, I guess I don't really have the patience for that anymore. And, and when I would be getting ready for a class, I would kind of feel stressed out thinking like, well, is any going to come and am I just going to be wasting two hours because nobody will show up or only have like two people when I've planned for 20 you know it's just like when it, once I really dug in and kept asking myself well why well why like a two-year-old will ask you why why mama why mama why mama why mama every time you give them a new that well why is that well why is that well you have to do that to yourself you have to go back to being two years old and ask yourself why over and over and over again do that for every um thing that's giving you trouble like um I used to do these art camps before I had kids. I used to do these big children's art camps and I bought paraffin wax in bulk. I don't know what I was thinking. I was using, I'm still using up this paraffin wax, but I get a big like five gallon bucket of cut up paraffin wax. And uh, for whatever reason, it's still, it's, I guess it's cause it's kind of under a bench. I don't really see it. Um, and I also found a ton of mason jars when I was decluttering my basement. And I thought, you know what might be kind of fun? Cause I've done candles and sold them like after my art camps closed and I was doing craft fairs, I did candles. I sold them. They all sold. Um, but they, it just seemed kind of like a big production to get all that stuff out to make a candle. So then I realized, well, why don't I just use it up? You know, I could do that in an afternoon. I could do it with my kids. I could let my kids make the candles and they could keep the profits for whatever they sell in my craft booth. And, um, and that would get them out of my studio, get the mason jars out of my studio. Cause I did decide to keep some of them. Um, and then I would have two clear sections of my basement that were comprised of candle making and, um, and mason jars. And then I was realized that I don't really love making soap that much. And I do still have some soap base and soap scents and things like that. Well, why don't I do the same thing with the soap? So you don't have to necessarily get rid of it. If you have a way that you can use it right up and get it out and that makes you feel better about it and maybe even helps you bring some money back in from it, you can go ahead and do that. Um, but then think twice before you bring that kind of supply back in. So now that we've dealt with why are we keeping these things? And I think another, another why, and hopefully you can get to this when you first ask yourself, why am I keeping this is guilt. Um, not only we have the security thing. I think that's very normal, especially if we have parents that grew up um, in the depression or were, you know, baby boomers and, you know, remember kind of ration, not rationing, but, you know, just being not wasteful before all of this easy consumer, cheap consumer goods came into our lives. Um, you know, so we were raised that way. So we feel a bit of guilt getting rid of things. We feel like it's wasteful, but we can also feel guilt. Like what I mentioned about having like an Etsy business, maybe it didn't do so well. Or you decided to just, it wasn't what it was all cracked up to be. And you decided it wasn't for you, but you're keeping these supplies. And I think sometimes we keep these supplies to punish ourselves. We say, next time I have some high flute idea, I'm going to look at that stack of card stock and business cards and leftover supplies. And that will swiftly remind me that I'm not cut out for it. Well, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't keep reminders of your failures. You've paid for that mistake once. You do not need to keep paying for it. That's something my sister said to me. Uh, we were, I can't remember, we were out shopping or something and and uh, I was joking about something that I bought that, uh, that I couldn't get rid of. She goes, you know what? I figure if I haven't used it and I'm not going to use it, I get rid of it. I've paid for that mistake once. I'm not going to keep paying for it by giving it a spot on my shelf or thinking about it anymore or regretting it anymore. I've already paid for that mistake. I'm done. So I think that's how we have to look at those types of items. I've paid for that mistake once. I'm done. It can go. It can be given away. It can be sold. It can be um, donated, whatever. So pay for your mistakes once and, and that's enough. You re you'll remember that um, that particular endeavor didn't work out, but 
it doesn't mean you shouldn't try again. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do something else. I heard this, uh, I think it was the owner of, owner or CEO of Amazon say uh, that he had to make so many, he has to make so many mistakes, so many failed ventures in order to hit the big ones. So if the most successful company in the world right now says that he makes mistakes because you gotta make some mistakes to make some big wins, then you can afford to make some mistakes too. So uh, don't keep things around because you regret buying them and as a form of punishment. And it seems so ridiculous to say that out loud and think, well, well, who would do that? Ask yourself why you're keeping that thing. You may be, you know, subconsciously punishing yourself by keeping those objects to remind yourself of a failure. That's ridiculous. Get rid of it. It's like if milk went bad, you took some milk out of the fridge and you sniffed it and it was bad, you will put that back in the fridge. It's not going to be any sweeter tomorrow. Don't put it back. Let it go. Get rid of it. Remember, take note of something that didn't work. That's fine. Next time, go forth with a better idea. I think you either succeed or you learn. There is no failure, especially in business and in art. No failure. You succeed or you learn. So you can let those things go right now. If you're keeping, around, keeping it around to punish yourself or to remind yourself of a failure, that is absolutely not a good use of space in your life or space in your brain. Okay, so now I want to talk about the things that we are going to buy because I am guilty of this. I am guilty of seeing something that I didn't even know existed five minutes ago and having to have it. I'm sure that you've had situations like that too. It's like, I was perfectly happy with all the colored pencils I had until I saw these uh, advertised during somebody's uh, CHA uh, video, which is a craft and hobby association. They debut products every January and I'm addicted to those videos. I've never actually been to CHA. I, I don't really like to travel. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that. I don't like traveling. I don't like flying. I don't like hotel rooms. I'm just like, I'm just like, I don't know. I like to be a hermit up in Maine, I guess. But anyway, these were double-ended pencils, which, you know, okay, you've probably seen them before for kids, but they have one color is dark and one is light and they coordinate. So all you have to do for your shade you color with a light color, then you flip your pencil over and color with a dark color to shade it. And that's that. And they're pretty fantastic. But so as soon as I saw them, I'm like, I need those pencils. I just need them. So <laughs> before you get all crazy, now, of course, when, it, when something comes out at CHA, you usually can't get it right away. So that kind of puts the damper on going hog wild over any of those things for me. But um, the thing that, you know, I asked myself, okay, Lindsay, you have Prismacolor, you have Colorsoft, you have Polychromos, um, you have Soho, which is cr made by Create a Color. You have this humongous variety of colored pencils already. What are those pencils going to do that the ones you already have do not do for you? Quite frankly, nothing. They're not going to do anything different than what my other pencils do. They're going to be more convenient because they have two ends and they, you know, they're, they're cool looking and they've got a cute packaging, cute little box, cute little display stand. Um, so I quickly realized that I wanted them because they were new, they were fun, I was curious, I wanted to try them. Um, and then as people started to ask me to review them, then that kind of gave me a little justification because it is part of my business reviewing these products. Um, the company did actually send me these um, to review. So I don't know if I would have, <clears throat> if, if people hadn't asked me to review them, I probably wouldn't have, have purchased them anyway, just because, you know, common sense would kick in. Lindsay, you have enough colored pencils. And um, it's like the color soft pencils. I had like a set of 24 and I was using them like crazy. I love them. So I said, I'm going to buy the set of 72, the full line. I hardly crack open that tin. I always grab my smaller tin because it's smaller, more convenient, fits on my table. So actually that's kind of one of the reasons I like this because it's smaller, convenient, fits on my table. And I just have 50 colors in the room of 24. So that's good. But I'm not trying to sell you on those pencils. What I'm trying to get at is really um, ask yourself why you want a product. What's it going to do for you? How is it better than what you already have? Keep asking yourself those questions. For me, um, getting those pen, those pen, no, again, they were sent to me by a company, which we're going to get into the sponsored content too, because I think a lot of us, uh, maybe don't realize that some of your favorite YouTubers and bloggers are sponsored by companies or sent things just randomly because, um, they're hoping they'll get reviewed. So, um, my personal, um, my personal rule of thumb for reviewing products is, um, if a company's offer, offering to send it to me for free, then it needs to be something that you guys have asked me to review. Um, if it's not something you've asked me to review, I decline the free offer because um, 
because then I'm just advertising to you. It's not something that you've asked me about that you want to know more about. So I just don't feel comfortable with that. Um, sometimes I'll review something because I'm personally curious about it, then I'll purchase the product like, you know, these, uh, these Rembrandt watercolors. I was really curious about them. Um, and I, so I purchased them and then I reviewed them because I was curious about them. Specifically, nobody asked me to review this set. They have asked me my opinion on Rembrandt watercolors before, but I didn't have a specific query to uh, review this. So I didn't, you know, call them up and ask them if I could have a sample. Um, so that's kind of like how I base things on. But I, and I think it's really important to realize that a lot of these brand new products we get all excited about, um, a lot of them are sent to bloggers to review, to try out, to test. Some are in like product development phase, like they're asking you to test it because they're trying to invent something new. And sometimes it's just kind of like that's part of their marketing spend. They'll send out products to different YouTubers and bloggers to try to get a little airtime. Um, and... I think it's kind of important to weigh everything you see with a grain of salt because if you already have watercolors you love, do you need to go and buy those Rembrandt watercolors? No. If you feel like you want a larger palette and you're trying to decide between a brand X, Y, and Z, then, you know, watch the reviews, watch the tutorials, see what you think, and then make the choice that's best for you. And I think that just buying because we get excited about something is a way to end up with a huge amount of stuff that you don't use because that shine wears off really quick. If you give yourself a little time, you keep asking yourself, why do I want that? Why do I want that? Why do that would do I want that? And a lot of times you'll get down to the, to the meat of the problem or the meat of the, the root of why you want something. And all it is, is that it's new, it's shiny, and I think it's going to rekindle my love for art. So there, I was watching this, this documentary on Netflix. It was called uh, The Minimalists, I think, or Minimalism. It, it, it was the uh, it was produced by the uh, the Minimalists. They have a blog. They're a couple of like ex um, big wig executives that decided to chuck it all and you know go minimalist. And um, and they had interviewed somebody and they were talking about how people buy more thinking you're gonna get that same burst. Of, um, of excitement and joy that you got from the first thing that you bought. So if you remember back to the first, say if you're a watercolor painter, your first set of watercolors and that joy that you got learning watercolor and how much you love that set and how everything was fresh and new and exciting and you're getting all these like synapses firing off in your brain and you're getting so much pleasure from painting that you think, wow, well, okay, this is, I'm getting all this joy from this cheap set of watercolors. What if I buy this really expensive set of watercolors? I bet I'm gonna have like, you know, a hundred times more joy from that. And you get that new expensive set and it's nice, it's an improvement, you like it, but you're not getting the same level of joy that you got from that first purchase. And I saw this other, um, this other, I think it might have been, I, don't, I think it was in the Spark Joy Con uh, Mari book. Um, they were talking about, and if it's not in that book, I apologize. Um, I read it right around the same time if it wasn't. Um, but they were talking about this little, this little boy who had this, this truck he carried everywhere. He loved it, played with a little matchbox truck, just was his favorite toy and he loved it. So the grandmother thought, well, I'm going to get him a set of, a big set of matchbox trucks because he likes that one so much, he'll like them all. So she gave him the set of max, matchbox trucks and then he didn't play with any of them anymore, not even the one that was his favorite, because once he got a bunch of them, that first one wasn't so special and didn't have any value anymore, and then he just, none of them had any value, because you had so much, it diluted, it diluted his, his interest so much that none of it brought joy, and I think that's what's happening with our craft rooms, with our hobbies. We get so much, we come down into our craft area, and then we're overwhelmed, and none of it brings joy. It's all become generic. It's all become dull. And when we just had a few things, we enjoyed it so much more. And I always go back to the analogy of when I first started scrapbooking. I had so much fun scrapbooking. For once, for one, it was a social um, hobby. You'd go to like a crop and you would see other women and you would talk about your kids and, you know, you would be doing something productive while also enjoying the fellowship of women. And um, I guess men too, but I just didn't happen to scrapbook with any men. None of them came. But, um, it was, it was such, it was so fun and everything I had fit into one tote and it was just exciting and new and fresh and everything just felt so fun. And then as you know, you, everyone started to get so many supplies and the stores started closing and everyone had all their supplies at home, people stopped scrapbooking. They, they lost the thing that made it special, having a few things that you liked, that you really loved working with, being around people you loved sharing that time with. And um, it became too overwhelming to create a simple page. So that's what happens. That's the downfall of having 
the excess, I think. So that third question to just add on to the two question video is ask yourself, why? Why do I want it? Why is this going to be better than what I already have? Why, why, why? Keep asking why until you get to the root of it. Why am I keeping it? Why am I keeping something that makes me feel bad? Why am I keeping something that reminds me that I failed? Ask yourself why. I think that will answer the rest of your um, excess product, excess thing questions. I hope so anyway. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy crafting!